And it is now noon, so we'll go ahead and get started. Greetings, welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Lineberger Cancer Network at the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. And I want to say welcome. Uh, it's March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, so happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy day to be here with us. And this is for our North Carolina Community College series of oncology lectures. Uh, a few details I'd like to go through with you. Uh, we'll meet our presenters and then uh, get started on our presentation. So uh, we'll be using Poll Everywhere today. I'll talk about that in a moment. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please give us a call, 919-445-1000. You may also email us at uncccn at unc.edu. And you, uh, you can always visit our website, unclcn.org, with lots of information there. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we will be using Poll Everywhere. This is completely anonymous, so uh, this is a great opportunity for you to interact with our presenters today. You'll get some questions. Uh, take your best shot at those. Again, it's all anonymous. Um, we'll be able to see the results of everyone's answers uh, on the screen, so that'll be fun. Then at the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our presenters, so I encourage you to be jotting down notes as we go along, and then sharing your questions with our presenters at the end. Three different ways you can use Poll Everywhere. I really like to just, uh, if, if you have a smartphone, uh, Android or, or iPhone, you can uh, just download the free app. Uh, that's the Poll Everywhere app. And then you just put in the letters UNCCN. You'll go ahead and see the, uh, the questions as they come up, and you can uh, just click on your answers. You can also go to any web browser anywhere in the world, even on the space station. Uh, just go polev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V.com, enter the letters U-N-C-C-N, and then again, just like with the app, you'll see the, uh, the answer options, and you can click on those, and then you can submit your questions at the end. Finally, if you prefer to uh, use text, we can support that too. Just text the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. You'll get a message back that you've joined. Then you can just select the um, letters that correspond to the correct answers, and then at the end, send your questions in. That's all there is to it. We have lots of lectures, so many lectures. Uh, first and foremost, for all of you uh, community college students and instructors, we have this series. We're wrapping up. This is the, the fourth lecture of the uh, academic year, so we'll be starting with more in the fall, and we'll send you announcements about that as we get closer to that. Uh, we also have all kinds of professional lectures, patient-centered care lectures, research to practice lectures, all of these are focused on oncology. All of them are free. And as you move from your, from your student role into your professional role and need uh, professional credits, uh, th this is a great way to get those. And again, all free of charge. OK, we will have a survey at the end. Uh, you can click on this now, and I'll show this again at the end, uh, either the QR code or unclcn.org forward slash eval. We really, really encourage you to uh, go ahead and, and fill out the evaluation. Let us know how we're doing. And yeah, what you'll notice when you go to that link is that it will bring you to the learning portal. If you're already logged in, you can just go to the bottom where it says Take Course, and then you'll click on the next link at the bottom. It will take you to the evaluation. If you haven't logged in, please log in. And if you're coming to the uh, learning portal for the first time, you'll see where you can create a free account. Go ahead and do that, and then you'll be able to get to uh, this page. Again, take the course, uh, do the evaluation, and we really appreciate that. And without further ado, North Carolina Community College Oncology Lectures, Caring for pati the Patient with Hematologic Cancers, Leukemia, Lymphoma, and Multiple Myeloma with Natalie Grober, MD, and Courtney W. Berry, MS, MA, BSN, RN, OCN. All right. And I mentioned poll everywhere. We always try to start off with kind of an easy one at the beginning. So patients with a hematologic cancer have a cancer affecting which part of the body? And I'll make this live in just a moment. It'll be A, brain, B, breast, C, kidneys, or D, blood. And again, everything's anonymous on here. So first off, uh, Dr. Natalie Grover 
is an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology. Her primary research interest is in novel therapies for the treatment of lymphoma. Her particular focus is in cellular therapy, including innovative approaches to, to chimeric antigen receptor T cell CAR T therapy, improving the efficacy of CAR T cells, and management and prevention of unique toxicities associated with treatment. Dr. Grover's ultimate goal is to improve therapeutic options for lymphoma patients while minimizing toxicities and maintaining their quality of life. Dr. Grover, welcome. So glad to have you here today. Happy to be here. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And Dr. Grover, can we, I'd like to ask you, can you tell our audience a little bit about your career trajectory? Uh, I'd love to hear about, you know, at what point in your life did you actually uh, become interested in oncology? And what steps did you follow to, to get to the place where you are now? So when I when I was in college, um, I worked I worked at a lab and I realized I enjoyed working in a lab, but I knew that I I knew from there that I really wanted to see patients and I was more more interested in the um, the direct patient side of things. So I had the opportunity to shadow an oncologist um, in undergrad, and that really I really enjoyed the connections he made with patients, um, the intera the interactions with patients, being able to kind of connect with patients during a really difficult time in their life and hopefully make a difference during that time. So that really drew me to oncology. So then, um, and I realized I wanted to go into medicine. So then I um, um, I went from college, I went on to um, med medical school. Um, and then, um, in re then and after medical school, I did residency in internal medicine, so kind of ge general medicine, and did more work in oncology and had an opportunity to work to really enjoyed my oncology rotations and found that after those oncology rotations, I was really wanting to check up on the patients and see how they were doing and was really draw drawn to that and that connected me um, from then on decided to do a fellowship to specialize in oncology and went to UNC and um, had wonderful mentorship at UNC and in, in lymphoma and in cellular therapy and ended up staying here for faculty as well. Great. Thank you so much. And, and just a reminder to all of our students uh, attending today that you do have an opportunity to ask questions. So if you have career questions for, for Dr. Grover, uh, be sure to, uh, to be jotting those down and sharing those at the end. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, Courtney Berry, and Courtney is an oncology nurse navigator in malignant hematology, primarily working with acute leukemia patients. She has degrees in health and exercise science, bioethics and nursing, as well as being an oncology certified nurse. She is particularly interested in improving quality of life for patients with hematologic malignancies, providing care at end of life, and addressing ethical issues in cancer care. Uh, Courtney, welcome. Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me, Tim. Um, so I'll tell a little bit about my career trajectory, too. Um, I Great. had a about way of um, getting into uh, medicine, but also into oncology. Um, I always knew that I wanted to be in medicine in some way, but I wasn't quite sure how. Um, I started with my undergrad degree in health and exercise science at Wake Forest, and it was really focused around chronic disease and older adults. Um, I, I always have really enjoyed working with older adults, and that tends to focus on a lot of quality, quality of life and symptom management. Um, during that time, I also worked in geriatric oncology at Wake Forest Baptist, which was a really cool opportunity. I went into clinical research for a bit and also did my master's degree in bioethics at Wake Forest, um, which helped me focus on like end-of-life care and advanced care planning. I did consulting for a bit, decided I missed patient care, and went to nursing school um, a few years ago and worked at the bedside on an inpatient oncology floor here at UNC, and then within the last two years transitioned to the outpatient world as a nurse navigator working with leukemia patients. So now I really like working with our older adults, especially who have a lot of symptom burden and um, really rely on the nurse navigator to help them navigate the complicated healthcare system and explain really difficult um, treatment decisions. Great. Thank you so much. And again, to our audience, if you have specific questions for Courtney, be sure to uh, save those and ask her at the end. All right. So here's that poll we were talking about, patients with, hematolo with uh, hematologic cancer 
uh, have a cancer affecting which part of the body? A, brain, B, breast, C, kidneys, or D, blood? And uh, take just about uh, 10 seconds, if you would, to go ahead and answer that. Um, I do see a, a bit of a trend here, so I, I think we're, we're running uh, pretty, pretty heavily in favor of, of D, the blood. Um, uh, Courtney and Dr. Grover, how are they doing? Great. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, so, so they've got this covered, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but just in case, we're, 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 gonna, we're still going to go through with the lecture. All right, leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma. Natalie Grover, MD, Courtney Berry, M BS, MA, MSN, RN, OCN, and I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much. Okay, you can go to the next next slide. I'll, I'll, I'll be starting off, and then um, Courtney will be finishing. Um, so before we stop, start talking about specific blood cancers, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to hematopoiesis, which is the formation of blood cells. And I know beginning, whenever I saw this chart, I would always kind of turn off, but this is this is important to at least get a little idea of to understand what blood, blood cancers come from. So blood cells begin as stem cells in the bone marrow, and stem cells can self-renew, but can also differentiate or mature into different types of cells, so red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. After they have matured, these cells enter the bloodstream, and then stem cells then commit to either a lymphoid or myeloid lineage. In the myeloid lineage, you have red blood cells, which carry oxygen around the um, body, and platelets, which help with clot clotting. So white blood cells fight infection in the body. There are two major types of white blood cells. There are the germ-eating cells, or granulocytes, which are part of the myeloid lineage, and then you also have the lymphocytes, which are part of the lymphoid lineage, and they are infection-fighting cells, so B cells, T cells, NK cells. Um, next slide. Blood cancers develop when normal cell development is blocked. So basically, at any one of these points of development, there's a natural change, and a cell starts replicating and becoming cancerous instead of continuing to mature. The type of blood cancer that develops depends on the point in the cell maturation cycle that this occurs. So moving on, we will now focus on lymphoma, myeloma, and leukemia. And to start, um, next slide. And I think we have a pullover question. So just to, just to, for fun, get your thoughts, what do you think is the most common hematologic malignancy? Um, and I'm not sure, I can't tell how many people answered, but... Um, Let's let's take maybe just a few more seconds. All right, so we've got we're we're sitting with about twenty percent at leukemia and eighty percent lymphoma. How are they doing? Yeah, they're doing great. Um, we can go we can go on to the next slide, which will kind of give the answer give the answer. Um, and so it's actually so looking at cancer site, the lymphoma is the most common type of blood cancer. And over here, in, the terms, in terms of the, all the new cases of cancer, this actually just talks about non-Hodgkin lymphoma and not Hodgkin lymphoma. So just even non-Hodgkin lymphoma is the seventh most common cancer type in both males and females, with leukemia slightly less common. And I saw that some people answered leukemia. And actually, in terms of the higher rates of death, leukemia has the higher rates of death than lymphoma because many lymphomas are curable, and it generally has a better prognosis. So even though lymphoma is more common, um, leukemia causes a higher percentage of a higher number of deaths per year um, among, among people. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, this just kind of gives you a proportion of the different blood cancers. So lymphoma is the most common, and then leukemia, and then um, myeloma. Um, and then next slide, I'll move on to a, just a patient, a patient presentation. So a 32-year-old male noticed an area of swelling in his neck. Um, he presents to his primary care doctor. Initially, this is felt to be an infection, and he's given antibiotics. He notices that this area of swelling is persisting with new swelling in his groin, so he again presents to his primary care doctor, refers him to a surgeon for a biopsy. And he has a biopsy that removes the lymph node, and we call that an excisional lymph node biopsy um, in his gro inguinal groin region. Um, next slide. Um, and I'll kind of give an introduction about lymphoma. So lymphoma is, as we said, is the most common type of blood cancer. Specifically, lymphoma is a cancer that affects lymphocytes, which are a type of white blood cell. Lymphocytes travel through the blood and lymphatic system to defend the body against foreign invaders like bacteria and viruses. Lymphomas usually develop when a change or mutation occurs within a lymphocyte, causing the abnormal cell to replicate faster than or live longer than a normal lymphocyte. 
like normal lymphocytes, cancerous lymphocytes can travel through the blood and lymphatic system and spread and grow in many parts of the body, including the lymph nodes, the spleen, the bone marrow, and other organs. Um, there are many different types of lymphoma, but I generally like to divide them between B-cell lymphoma and T-cell lymphoma, with the majority of lymphomas being B-cell lymphomas. I also like to think of them as being either an aggressive subtype or an indolent or slow-growing subtype. Um, next slide. And another poll everywhere question, um, what is the most common cause of lymphoma? Herbicides, HIV AIDS, Epstein-Barr virus, or unknown? We can give you a little bit of time to answer. All right, and again, uh, take uh, just another five seconds or so. Go ahead and uh, take your best guess on that. Most common cause of lymphoma, and if you're doing this with the texting, uh, A for pesticides, herbicides, B for HIV AIDS, uh, C for Epstein-Barr, or D for unknown. Okay, how are they doing? Yeah, you're doing great. This is kind of a trick question. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, um, the one, the question that almost every patient I see ask them. Um, pretty much every time, every time I see a new patient is, what caused their lymphoma? Um, and unfortunately, the majority of patients, um, you know, some of these others might be right, but right now we really don't know in most patients. I can't find, specifically tell them what caused their lymphoma. Um, there are some chemicals that are suspected as causing lymphoma, such as certain pesticides or herbicides. You may have heard about the recent Roundup lawsuits um, or Agent Orange, which is going to be an issue in Vietnam vets. Um, like with many other types of cancer, high-dose radiation exposure could also be a concern. Um, and given this is a cancer of the immune system, there are also immune links. For example, patients with immune deficiency, so those with HIV or AIDS or who have had transplants or are on immunosuppressant medications may have increased risk, as well as patients with autoimmune disease. And finally, there are some infections that are linked with certain types of lymphoma as well. Um, next slide. Um, and lymphoma is pretty heterogeneous and can present in many different ways, including with no symptoms and incidental findings on a scan. Many patients initially present with an enlarged lymph node, which manifests as a new mass or a lump. Um, this is often painless in lymphoma. And here's just a diagram of lymph node regions in the body that can kind of help picture um, what we think about um, in patients. Um, patients can also present with what we call as B symptoms. So, and that's more common with aggressive lymphoma. And so B symptoms, those include weight loss, which is more than 10% of body weight over six months, fevers, and night sweats. And I think for night sweats, it's important. It's not just someone saying, oh, I feel a little damp or hot at night. It's, these are, I usually ask a question, do you change your clothes or sheets overnight? So these are drenching night sweats. They're not subtle. Um, other symptoms include fatigue, itching, abdominal fullness or early satiety, or increased belt size, which could be related to an enlarged, to an enlarged spleen, or a cough, which can be from a chest mass. Um, next slide. Um, continuing on with our case presentation, the patient's biopsy is consistent with follicular lymphoma. He has a PET scan, which shows many enlarged and bright lymph nodes above and below the diaphragm. He is asymptomatic from his lymphoma and would prefer not to start treatment. Um, decision is made to watch and wait. Um, next slide. Um, and I'll discuss some of the diagnostics tests you may hear about in lymphoma. Um, one of the most important tests, of course, is the biopsy. In lymphoma, you generally need a larger sample of tissue to get an idea of what the cells look like in the lymph node and better characterize the type of lymphoma. So core biopsy, there's a final aspiration, and then you have a core biopsy, which uses a larger needle, and a surgical biopsy, which actually takes some of, out some of the tissue. So that's generally the best, although, of course, it may have more side effects and um, risks. Um, and I think moving on, I think I just have X's and move on to so the final aspiration is almost never a core biopsy sometime, but in general, we prefer, we prefer the surgical biopsy. Um, a positron emission tomography or a PET scan um, uses a radio tracer, so a radioactive form of sugar, to show up the most active cells in the body. Um, in some types of lymphoma, the cells are very active, so they show up very clearly on a PET scan. Um, the radio tracer that is usually used is um, fluorodeoxyglucose, or FDG, and patients are given this by injection into a vein before they have the scan. And then the FDG travels to the cells in the body that use glucose um, for energy, 
And then the cancerous, including lymphoma cells, use up a lot of energy, and so they need a lot of glucose. And the radio tracer is taken up into these cancerous cells, and they become trapped there, and then these cells show up as hot spots on the scan. And here you can see an example of a PET scan before and after treatment, and you can see that there's bright areas and, of lymphoma, and that after treatment that improved with treatment, and the only bright areas that remain are the brain which, and the heart, which are also always active and take up the sugar, and the urinary system, which is how the radio tracer is excreted. Next guy. Um, I'm going to talk about the different types of lymphoma now. So aggressive lymphomas are more often symptomatic at presentation, but not always. I've seen a few patients who are likely diagnosed earlier in disease course who don't have symptoms. In many cases, they are curable. Um, it's important to remember that stage 4 for lymphoma is not the same as for other cancers and that many stage 4 lymphomas are curable. Um, stage 4 just means it involves an organ, um, and a lot of times these patients are still curable. Um, there are many types of aggressive lymphomas. The most common is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and in Hodgkin lymphoma, I consider it as an aggressive lymphoma as well. This tends to affect younger patients and has a very high cure rate, and Burkitt lymphoma is the most aggressive type of lymphoma and grows very quickly. Um, next, next slide. You also have indolent types of lymphomas. These are generally slower growing and are often asymptomatic at presentation. They are generally not considered curable, but are considered treatable and may still have a good prognosis with a long life expectancy. In general, these tend to occur in older patients. In some instances, you don't have to treat these patients if they aren't having any symptoms, and you might even be able to watch and wait and start treatment if they develop symptoms. The most common type is follicular lymphoma. Here's just a pathology picture of that. Um, and then moving on to the patient, over the next year, he notes that the lymph nodes are continuing to grow and causing discomfort because they're getting so big. He also notes increased fatigue. And here's a picture of a scan, and you can see um, a lot, you know, um, bright areas in, around his neck, um, in his axillary area, in his armpits, um, in his groin area. Um, and he has, so he has pretty bulky and high burden disease. And so the decision is made to start combination chemotherapy to treat his lymphoma. Um, next slide. And then for treatment, there are many different types of treatment for lymphoma. Um, as I said before, there's observation for some indolent types of lymphoma. And so for some patients, we use radiation. And this is often the case in patients with disease in one specific area that can be covered by a radiation field. For most patients, we use chemotherapy. And then this is also changing. So the landscape for chemotherapy for lymphoma is changing. There are different types of chemotherapy, including traditional chemotherapy, um, immunotherapy, new targeted drugs. As with all cancer types, we have many different types of clinical trials that we always encourage patients to participate in as well. Next slide. And then, of course, the side effects of treatment depend on the type of treatment. Common side effects for kind of traditional um, initial lymphoma combination therapy um, include fatigue, hair loss, um, nausea, vomiting. Um, I do think we're a lot better at managing the side effect and being proactive and using drugs to help prevent nausea in the first place. Um, mucositis or mouth sores, infections, low blood counts requiring blood or platelet transfusions, neuropathy, which can start off as numbling, numbness and tingling in the fingertips and toes, but can progress to interfering with doing daily activities, buttoning shirts, writing, or causing instability and falls, um, cardiac and pulmonary toxicity. Next slide. Um, as I discussed, lymphoma often has a very good prognosis, so survivorship is also a big component of care for these patients. As you can see here for Hodgkin lymphoma, at about 15 years post-diagnosis, their chance of dying from other things, including other cancers or cardiac events, is higher than their chance of dying from their lymphoma. Of course, there are many issues in patients treated for lymphoma, including concern about relapse, um, depression and anxiety, fatigue or cognitive deficits, cardiac concerns from some chemotherapy being toxic to the heart. I counsel patients on the importance of quitting smoking and modifying other cardiac risk factors. Um, issues of lung toxicity from either chemotherapy or radiation, um, bone marrow toxicity from chemotherapy, including um, increased risk for leukemia, which you'll hear about later, and other cancers, for example, or breast or lung cancers from radiation. It's really important for these patients to continue following closely either of their oncologist in a survivorship clinic and with their primary care doctor as well. Um, next slide. Moving on, I'm going to present another case. A 67-year-old woman presents with a three-month history of progressive back pain and a two-week history of lower extremity weakness. Labs are significant for anemia, 
hypercalcemia or high calcium, and elevated creatinine, um, renal dysfunction. An MRI of her spine shows a vertebral body mass of extension into her T12 epidural space, leading to spinal cord compression, and a bone marrow biopsy shows sheets of atypical plasma cells. And I'll kind of talk about this a little more in a second. Um, so this is multiple myeloma. Myeloma is a cancer of plasma cells, so abnormal plasma cells replace normal bone marrow cells. And, um, and you can see on the slide you have these, um, these cells that kind of look like, I don't, I don't know, even like a, um, with, the little, the, with their little um, nucleus kind of at the side of them and the, um, and the big um, cell or cytoplasm around it. So you can see those abnormal cells that all look the same over there. Um, plasma cells are a type of white blood cell found in the bone marrow. Um, next, next slide. Um, B cells are a type of white blood cell that is found in the bone marrow that develops into plasma cells. Healthy plasma cells are part of the immune system and make proteins called antibodies, which help fight infection. So on the left here, you see a few plasma cells in the bone marrow making different types of antibodies. In myeloma, plasma cells undergoes a malignant change caused by one or more acquired genetic mutation, causing it to multiply into many malignant plasma cells which then crowd out the healthy white blood cells, the red blood cells and platelets in the bone marrow, and interfering with their normal production. The malignant plasma cells or myeloma cells produce abnormal proteins, and you have a higher level of this protein. Um, they're called monoclonal protein because they come from cells that started as single malignant cell. So MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, is when you have a monoclonal protein in the blood, but no other symptoms. So you have a smaller number of the abnormal plasma cells. Smoldering myeloma refers to a slow-growing type of myeloma in which malignant plasma cells produce too much of an abnormal antibody, but there are no symptoms from this. Um, next slide. So multiple myeloma is the 14th most common cancer. Um, it's incurable, but there are a lot of treatments, including many therapies approved over the past several years, and its prognosis has increased from survival of two to three years to over 10 years. Um, so it's really changed over, over recently. It's generally a disease of the elderly with an average age of 70 at diagnosis. Next slide. Um, we use the crab mnemonic as we think about symptoms and signs of myeloma. Um, the C stands for high calcium, hypercalcemia or high calcium, and that can cause confusion or constipation. And this is caused by bone destruction releasing calcium into the blood. Um, the R stands for renal failure, which is poor function of the kidneys due to deposits of the protein, the monoclonal protein in the blood. Um, the A stands for anemia or low red blood cell count, which can cause fatigue and also can, some, can cause someone to look pale. Um, this is due to myeloma cells crowding out the normal bone marrow cells, which causes a decrease in the number of red blood cells. Um, the B is for bone lesions. Myeloma causes more bone destruction and can also lead to lytic lesions or holes in the bones. This causes bones to be more fragile and break more easily. Um, patients often can have back pain because the bones in their vertebrae or back bones may collapse um, or press on their nerves. Um, they may get compression of their spinal cord when the vertebral body compression fractures, um, leading to bone fragments being displaced into the spinal canal. And the other time patients may get compression of their spinal cord is from plasma cytomas. So plasma cytomas occur when the malignant plasma cells accumulate in another part of the body and not the bone marrow. Um, and symptoms of spinal, and then, um, so that can also sometimes cause spinal cord compression as well. Um, and symptoms of spinal cord compression may include numbness, um, pain, or go as far as loss of bowel or bladder control or paralysis. Next slide. Um, so in general, myeloma can be followed easily by markers in the blood, um, you check for what we call a monoclonal protein. Um, in myeloma, you have the malignant plasma cells making large amounts of single antibody, which we call an M spike, or a monoclonal immunoglobulin spike. The M proteins can be measured in the blood or urine, and the levels generally correlate with a patient's disease. So um, a serum protein electrophoresis test, um, or an SPEP, is a test in which proteins in the blood are separated out so that the individual antibodies can be identified and quantified. And in general, the immunoglobulins are concentrated in the gamma region, but you have different levels of them. Um, they're similar, but slightly different proteins. So they migrate somewhere together, but not completely. So you can see it's kind of like a hill or um, on the gel on the top in the top picture. And in the picture below, you see a and that monoclonal protein, and that migrates uniformly. 
And so that's why it causes this M spike. Um, you also can do, um, in addition to um, the SPAP, you also do skeletal survey or a PET scan to look for bone involvement, um, those lytic lesions I was talking about, um, the bone destruction from the myeloma, and you also check labs to look for anemia and high calcium or kidney dysfunction as well. Next slide. So this patient had the spinal cord compression. She's urgently treated with steroids and radiation. Um, she was discharged from the hospital to rehab and continued to improve her strength and mobility. And then she was ultimately started on chemotherapy for her multiple myeloma, and her disease has been well controlled. Um, next slide. So myeloma is generally incurable, but as I said before, there are a lot of treatment options available now. The general course of myeloma treatment is that patients tend to have shorter durations of remission as their disease progresses. Um, most chemotherapy for myeloma is outpatient. Treatment can have various levels of intensity, ranging from a daily pill to high-dose chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant. Next slide. Um, different treatments can have different side effects. In general, most patients don't receive traditional chemotherapy like they do for lymphoma and are instead treated with some of these newer drugs. Um, some of the things we think about depending on the treatment um, include neuropathy, um, diarrhea, constipation, low blood counts and infection risk, rash, cardiac side effects. Many patients are also on steroids for part of their treatment, which can also have side effects, including insomnia, mood changes, and high blood sugars. Next slide, and moving on to Courtney. All right, we're going to shift gears into a crash course in leukemia now. So Mr. O is a 63-year-old man. He presents to his local emergency department with a dog bite on his hand. Um, he had routine labs, including a CBC with differential, and it showed a white blood cell count of 150,000, hemoglobin of 7.4, platelets of 43,000, and some blast cells in his peripheral blood. In obtaining a health history, the patient explains that he has been really tired for the last month and he has had some bleeding in his gums, but he has not thought much about it and had been putting off going to his doctor. He's admitted to the hospital for an emergent workup and treatment. Next slide. So he was diagnosed with leukemia ultimately, but leukemia is a malignant disorder of blood cells and lymphatic tissues, most commonly involving the white blood cells. So you can see on the right, normal blood versus leukemia, where you've got a lot of immature white blood cells. And it's categorized based on which type of white blood cells involved, either a lymphocyte or a myeloid cell, and whether the illness is developing quickly, so acute or slowly, which would be chronic leukemia. And blasts are those precursors to mature circulating blood cells, and they crowd out the healthy bone marrow tissue. So it's not functioning properly. It's blocking formation of normal cells, and they grow and survive much better than those normal cells. Next slide. This is just a quick little picture of the pathology of each different type. So you've got the acute, and you can have myeloid or lymphoid, and same for chronic. So these are either acute being the more aggressive and quick growing or chronic being the mature but dysfunctional cells. Next slide. So just quickly, um, this just shows the difference in each type of the epidemiology of each type of leukemia. So primarily it's a, a disease of aging like most cancers, but you can see that ALL is actually more common in younger people. So that's the one that you might see in the pediatric population primarily. Um, when you hear of like a little three-year-old getting leukemia, that's going to typically be your um, ALL. But it also does affect, AML also does affect pediatric populations. The survival rate is much higher in pediatrics. Um, so if a um, older adult gets AML or ALL, the survival rate is much lower, as you can see. And then chronic leukemia is typically in our older adults, and um, that requires a lot less aggressive treatment. Next slide. So which of the following are risk factors for leukemia? Age, exposure, exposure to radiation, or exposure to previous chemotherapy treatments, or D, all of the above? All right, and uh, take about five more seconds, if you would. Well, looks like we're, we're settling on all of the above. How did they do? Looks good. So 
So there's a lot of risk factors for leukemia, but sometimes, like with lymphoma, we don't really know exactly where it came from. Sometimes the the tests can show certain genetic markers that show what, where it may have come from, um, but age is going to be one of the biggest ones. And then just cellular damage from things like smoking or um, pre-leukemia, so the, some diseases like MDS and MPN can cause those changes that eventually could lead to leukemia. Exposure to radiation is also a big one, but it's hard to pinpoint how that happened. Um, chemical exposures like chemotherapy, so we see a lot of people get secondary leukemia from other cancer treatments, and that's a lot of the patients that we see here at, at UNC also, and those people require a different type of treatment often because they've already seen some of the chemotherapies that we may give them typically. They um, may need something different so it doesn't cause more damage on their heart or doesn't um, completely destroy their bone marrow where it isn't able to build back up. But there's a few other things that could cause it, including viruses, genetic disorders, and there can be a genetic component, but there's a little, it, it's a little hard to tell. <laughs> Next slide. Symptoms of leukemia. This, there's a lot of symptoms here, but really the, the main um, points are that it's signs of bleeding and, and signs of easy infection. So people might show up with bleeding gums and they think, oh, I've just got sensitive gums, I need to go see my dentist. Um, they may have some soreness or swollen lymph nodes um, and just think it's the typical cold. They may have joint pain, inflammation, um, may show up with abnormal lung sounds like they have pneumonia and UTIs, um, having like swollen gums and bleeding gums, petechiae, which are those little spots of, that look like tiny bruises all over the body. Um, a lot of these things don't really sound like much in isolation, so people might not think that it's something more serious, but they often will go to their doctor and um, have some blood tests run and it raise alarm. Next slide. So typically the way that people find out that they have leukemia are first those lab results that give us reason to scratch our heads and think something's wrong. Um, so a CBC with differential especially. Um, and then you might see especially a bone marrow biopsy, which is going to show us the different types of cells and um, do some karyotyping in fish to see what types of changes in the chromosomes and genes there are, and then also a lumbar puncture, and that's going to tell us also if there is leukemia in the spinal fluid. Next slide. So going back to the case, Mr. O received his bone marrow biopsy to confirm a diagnosis of leukemia. He started on a drug called hydroxyurea to lower his white blood cell count to a safe range, and the result came back a couple of days later. He is diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Next slide. So there's a lot of different treatments depending on the type of leukemia and the cytogenetics that come back. Um, so like I said, hydroxyurea is often used early to lower the white blood cell count to a more safe range to use other chemotherapy or other treatments. Um, we often give IV chemotherapy for acute leukemia patients in the hospital, and this typically requires a really long stay in the hospital, 30 days, 45 days, depending on um, how quick their blood cells bounce back. Um, we have a lot of good new options, especially for older adults that are chemotherapy injections that we might give on the outpatient side so they can um, prevent them from staying in the hospital for these really long stays. And then we've got oral chemotherapy that we use um, for both acute patients and especially our chronic patients. Immunotherapy is a cool new place of research in leukemia. Um, lumbar punctures with um, intrathecal chemotherapy, which is used a lot in like our um, ALL patients. Radiation, which is less common, but sometimes also used, especially in ALL. Blood transfusions, especially, we use those with our um, acute patients when we destroy their bone marrow uh, cells with the chemotherapy, we have to give them a lot of blood transfusions to keep them safe. Uh, and then eventually, often patients go to a bone marrow or a stem cell transplant. We also utilize palliative care for symptom control, and then a lot of patients often pursue hospice care when they are at the end of life. So just going back to be a little bit more specific about 
AML treatment, this is a really hard treatment for patients. They stay in the hospital for 30, 45 days, depending on how they're doing. And it's a really aggressive treatment of IV chemotherapy at first. Um, a lot of high symptom burden, a lot of blood transfusions, and the goal is to get them into a remission. And once they get into a remission, they can go on to consolidation, which is a little bit easier for patients, but it is still in the hospital. They um, get about five days of chemotherapy, and then we just keep rechecking their blood counts over and over. We do several cycles of this to keep them into a remission. If they relapse, we sort of go back and go kind of back to the beginning a little bit. Um, but like I mentioned before, too, we've got some cool new treatments for older adults, especially, or people who are not responding to treatment, that we can do a lot of treatment outpatient now. Next slide. And then ALL treatment is similar, but a little bit different. Um, we do an induction similar to AML, but then move on to consolidation or intensification, which is a, it depends on what type of regimen we go with, um, depending on what cells are. Um, what markers are in their cells. Um, then we also do those lumbar punctures with IT chemotherapy, and those are pretty frequent. And then if everything is going well, we move on to maintenance, which is a lot of oral medications and less frequent um, touch points with our group. Next slide. And then chronic leukemia, this makes it look really simple compared to acute leukemia, but we're really giving a lot more oral drugs in chronic leukemia, which is a lot more um, convenient for patients. However, all these chronic leukemias can also transform to acute leukemia, so we keep a close eye on our patients at first and just make sure that we're doing the right thing in terms of watching and waiting if they're asymptomatic or treating them with the right drug to make sure that they're not progressing through their disease. And then side effects of treatment are very similar to lymphoma, so we um, see a lot of low blood counts, so they have a risk of infection. We really keep a close eye on people to make sure that if they have a fever that they come into the hospital so they can get worked up and they probably will end up being admitted. Um, we have a really high risk for bleeding in this population, so a lot of blood transfusions. Um, fatigue, mucositis, which is the sores in the mouth, taste changes or appetite changes, losing their hair, nausea and vomiting, um, damage to the heart from chemotherapy, um, infertility, diarrhea or constipation, neuropathy, and then a lot of distress and anxiety. So who might you see on a patient's oncology team? The oncologist, cancer support program, palliative care, physical therapy, or all of the above? All right, and it looks like we're, like we're uh, landing on all of the above again. <laughs> Good job. So I think for patients, it gets really confusing because there's a lot of people involved in cancer treatment, but that's for a good reason that we have an interdisciplinary team. We want everybody to use their expertise to take the best care of patients. So you've got like oncologists and nurse practitioners, physicians assistants. You've got often at big cancer hospitals have people like me who's a nurse navigator who is caring for a patient um, pretty closely with the oncologist palliative care for symptom control. We have a really great cancer support program with counselors and nutritionists and um, just about anything you could think of, including helping patients get wigs if their hair falls out and that's just stressing to them. PT, OT, rec therapy, nutrition. Our um, adolescent young adult program is really important for fertility preservation and um, walking these young patients through unique problems that they experience bone marrow transplant, financial counselors. Our patients often have to be out of work or their um, significant other has to be out of work, so we have to help them get through that and do a lot of paperwork for them and help them um, know the best steps for them financially. Psychiatry, infectious disease, hospice, infu our infusion center is always really busy, inpatient team, um, pharmacists, social work, interventional radiology, which is the people who sometimes do our biopsies and then also put in central lines for our patients to get chemotherapy, radiation folks, um, of course, nursing staff, and many more people um, depending on what the patient needs. So you can see the number of people who might be involved in a patient's care team.
All right. Thank you both so much. And so now we get to the question portion. And as mentioned, there's a place and poll everywhere that should be available for you now where you can go ahead and uh, share questions with, with our presenters. Um, let me just take a look and see if we've gotten any in yet. Not yet. But uh, while we're waiting for those to come in, let me ask um, from a prevention standpoint, we're, with, with some types of cancer, we're, we're very familiar with uh, reducing or eliminating tobacco, association with alcohol, the sun, et cetera. Are, are there prevention measures that one can take with hematologic cancers, or is that less common? That's a good question. We don't, there's not anything specifically that we know in terms of prevention, um, unfortunately, you know, for, uh, unfortunately for these patients. There's not the same kind of tight link with smoking and alcohol or other types of things. So right now, we don't know anything specifically in terms of prevention for these cancers. All right. Thank you. And uh, again, this if, if you would like to share a question with our presenters, go ahead and do that now. And uh, let, let's see, another one, what, what would, what's your sense of what would draw somebody uh, to hematologic oncology? What are the sorts of things that, that one might find particularly gratifying with, with this area of oncology as opposed to um, some, some, you know, uh, breast cancer, lung cancer, some of the other areas that are focused on? This is definitely a more rare um, cancer, so I think it's it's interesting because community cancer hospitals may not treat these patients very frequently, so often if people are on a, if people are out in the community, they come to these bigger cancer hospitals. So you get to see people maybe from all around the state or all around the region, which is really cool. Um, and then it's also just fast paced. Um, these patients can be really sick um, and really sick all at once. So um, caring for them both on the inpatient side and outpatient, we've got to kind of be on our toes a lot. Um, so if you like fast paced and you like new things coming out all the time and coming up with unique solutions, I think is a, definitely a theme malignancy problem. <laughs> Good to know. Dr. Grover, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think I also, you know, just it's also just very heterogeneous. You know, there's, you know, there's young, depending on the type of hemologic cancer, you have young patients, you see older patients. Um, and exactly, it's a very systemic, you know, you have to think about it doesn't affect like one, you know, affects the blood, but which kind of basically affects your whole body. So you really have to know know all of medicine and kind of think about, you know, infectious disease, different um, organ functions. So it's really, it really always kind of always keeps you on your toes, um, which I enjoy as well. Great, great. And we do have questions starting to roll in. Uh, what is the monitoring frequency for patients with the chronic form of leukemia? Typically, at first, it's it's frequent. Um, we would want to make sure that we get them, especially if they're symptomatic, get them on a treatment that is helping their symptoms go away and also not causing really bad symptoms in return. So sometimes it takes a little bit of fine tuning on the dose or um, of the medication they're on or um, changing to a different agent often um, to make sure that that disease is under control. And then once it is under control, we can go to like every six months, maybe a year if they, they're doing really well. Um, at first, though, we might be doing every other week. Um, and really, we want to just make sure that their symptoms are well controlled and that their disease is going in the right direction or stable. Great. Thank you. And another question, what are some of the other career opportunities in oncology care? So I know it's a, it's a big team a, a approach, and you had that slide just a couple of slides back, but maybe you can talk about a few of, uh, of the other areas uh, uh, that, that are involved with caring for the patient with cancer. I can say a few, and Natalie, if I forget any, you can chime in. It, pretty much any, any career could point to oncology in some way. Um, I think ones that people don't think of very often are maybe social workers, which we rely on very heavily. Um, Think about if a patient loses their insurance because they can't go to work anymore and um, they need to be on disability and things like that. We really, they help us with patients, huge, huge. Um, and then nutritionists, um, we have oncology specific massage therapists, um, trying to think lab techs. I mean, there's just about anything in the medical field, but then also social support, especially. I think clinical other thing is kind of clinical trials. So clinical trial coordinators are a big are also kind of 
it's also another um, career point um, where um, sometimes they're nurses, but other times they're um, they they aren't, um, and they help us um, um, talk to patients about clinical trials, help monitor patients on clinical trials, and it's a get, great way to kind of get involved in research as well. So they work great. Thank you. Uh, what is the survivor, survivability like for a patient with follicular lymphoma? That's a really good question. I think um, one of the challenges, it's a good challenge, and I tell patients this too, of follicular lymphoma is that for a lot of our trials, and a lot, it's really hard to show overall um, overall survival um, benefits in follicular lymphoma because patients are living are living so long. So many of these um, many of these patients are living you know t ten plus years, and a lot of times they have they may have um, depending on how you know there's some forms of follicular lymphoma that can be more aggressive, and patients may die from their follicular lymphoma or, or may turn into a more aggressive lymphoma. But for a lot of patients, they can they get a treatment and then can go ten plus years. With, um, in remission, not needing another treatment. So, are all, um, so um, for a lot of patients, the prognosis is good, and a lot of these patients actually pass away from other medical conditions um, not related to their lymphoma. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Grover, you mentioned immunotherapy for certain types of lymphomas. And uh, what's involved with this type of immunotherapy? Yeah, so there's actually there's a lot of um, different types of immunotherapy for patients with lymphoma. The most common one and that we use now is actually a drug called um, rituximab, and that's um, what we call the monoclonal antibody. Um, it's actually um, um, it targets a marker on B cells, CD20. So now we have kind of these antibodies that target target markers on lymphoma cells. Um, and in B cell lymphomas, um, since they involve B cells and all these B cells have CD20, that's that's one therapy that's really changed the prognosis for lymphoma and it's actually involved now. We combine it with chemotherapy and give it to all patients. Um, there's also um, other types of immunotherapy now. So uh, my research is, interest is in CAR T cell therapy. So now that's actually um, t um, a cell therapy that actually takes a patient's own T cells. Um, you take them out and then, then you engineer them to um, actually um, target, also target a marker on their lymphoma cells. Um, and so, so there's different, there's both drugs and also um, patients' own um, a kind of personalized therapy for patients as well, using their own cells, um, as well as um, stem cell transplant as well. And we right. use immunotherapy and um, leukemia as well, similar, some rituximab and um, CAR-T is, is a new place of research in leukemia as well. And then things like enotuzumab and blenotumumab, which are um, newer drugs. Um, I see this question about success rate of AML treatment. That one's really mm -hmm. hard. Um, it, if you remember that slide about epidemiology, um, so if you're the younger you are, basically the better you're going to do with AMLs, that five-year survival rate. And also, it just depends on, it's really age and, of course, a 65-year-old, um, two different 65-year-olds may be completely different. Um, so somebody may be fit and have no other chronic health conditions. They're going to do much better with treatment than somebody who has three other health conditions like diabetes, previous stroke, things like that. Um, so it really depends on the individual person, but then how quickly we can get them into a remission and then typically on to um, bone marrow transplant. So. I have, I, as a new nurse, I met some patients who did really, really well, um, and they're still very much living and, and thriving. Um, I also take care of a lot of patients who pass away, so it's a, it's really just depends on the individual person. Thank you. And uh, we have one, obviously, we can't speak too specifically to a particular person, but uh, my grandfather had leukemia. This makes me concerned for my dad. What signs and symptoms should I watch for? So I guess, you know, a couple things in there, obviously the symptoms piece, that, but then also what, how, how prevalent is the hereditary component in this? I think that's a hard question, but um, I, I don't see that there's a huge hereditary component. Um, it's not like other cancers where, you know, like breast cancer, if you have like the BRCA1 gene or you might... Um, want to have your family tested for that. There's not really good things to test for in that way. Um, of course, just keeping as healthy as possible. And um, if you notice anything sort of funny going on, just go to the doctor and, and have blood work done. Um, but I wouldn't be too uh, really concerned. This is not something that typically goes through families um, generation by generation. It does increase the risk slightly, but um, not significantly. Okay, thank you so much. 
we should probably go ahead and start wrapping up. I, I want to put in a quick plug for other lectures because as, as you're mentioning various topics here, I'm thinking, oh, we have a lecture for this, we have a lecture for that. Just last week, Dr. Caliccio presented on uh, the toxicities associated with immunotherapy and dealing with that. Uh, we've talked about hospice and palliative care, and we have lectures on that, uh, and treating side effects and uh, social work and so many other things. So I encourage um, you to, as, as a listener here today, to uh, go ahead and take a look in our library or on our learning portal at some of the many, many different lectures that we have, both in the community college series first and foremost, but then across the board. And we do have uh, several hundred lectures available now. And, they're all completely searchable down to every word and every presentation through uh, through the search in our in our video library. So uh, do visit there and then uh, don't hesitate to let us know if you have any questions. Uh, we always want to say thank you. We want to say thank you to uh, the citizens of North Carolina for their generosity uh, through the state legislature in funding the University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank our team, and that's Mary King and Veneranda Obore and John Powell for all of the work they do for each and every one of the lectures in this series. Uh, we do want to let you know that we are planning more lectures as always, so we'll have four more coming up in 2021, 2022. If you signed up for this lecture, we have you in our, on our lists, and we'll be getting back with you this summer about specific dates for the, for the next academic year. Um, and if you are, are, come across this some other way, uh, please contact us so that we can get you on our mailing list. You can just email us, unccn at unc.edu, or um, Call us, 919-445-1000. Let's see, what else? Uh, we have palliative care and hospice for the cancer patient. That's online in our, in our North Carolina Community College uh, section of the learning portal, and that's with uh, Dr. Gary Winselberg and Jenny Hanspell. And uh, gynecologic cancer is a team approach to women's health care with uh, Dr. Clark Pearson and Lynn Phillip. And uh, we had a special appearance by... Uh, Herbie the, the Bassett uh, there, uh, who's, a, who's a service dog, uh, and made that one especially fun. So um, you can, as a community college student, you can go to uh, any of the, the lectures that are in the portal, and you can uh, sign up, take that, um, take the test, and then get a certificate of participation to give you to your instructor. And if you're an instructor, you can assign these to your students. Uh, if, if doing this as a class is not convenient, you can do this on an individual basis for extra credit or as part of uh, required learning within a course, and then students have to uh, take tests and, and provide those certificates of participation validating that they've not only watched the content but also uh, been able to, to pass the assessment before getting the certificate. Let us know if you have questions about any of that. As we mentioned at the beginning, your feedback is really important to us. So please, please, please take just a minute. Uh, you can either go to unclcn.org forward slash eval, or you can uh, take your smartphone and uh, catch that QR code that's there. They'll get you to the same place. Please uh, go ahead and log into the portal and take care of that evaluation. We really appreciate that. And uh, other than that, you know where to find us, unccn at unc.edu. Uh, 919-445-1000, our website, unclcn.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube. Lots of places to find us. Uh, we would love to hear from you if you have questions or comments. All right, Dr. Grover, thank you so much. Uh, Courtney, thank you so much. Good to see everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day, and we'll look forward to seeing our community colleges students again in the fall. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. We really appreciate your time and expertise today. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Bye. Bye-bye.